The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 754 for Monday, March 25th, 2019. Uh, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. The show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, we mix them all together, we answer your questions, we share your tips, we share your cool stuff found. The goal, of course, is that we all, every one of us, every single one of us, me included, him included, you, her, everybody, yeah, yeah, we have to. We all come here to learn at least five new things together. Sponsors for this episode include... Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, Hair Club at HairClub.com slash MGG, Jamf now at Jamf.com slash MGG. We'll spell out those URLs and explain what they'll do for you shortly here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, where it seems that spring has kind of sprung, but not really. Because we've got flowers and birds and stuff, but then there's going to be more snow. What's going on here? This is John F. Braun. Yeah, welcome to New England. That's how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> we don't we don't quite have like it hasn't sprung here. You know, you and I are we're very close together, but uh, geographically, of course, but not right at the same latitude. And we wind up. I, I well, usually, it's worse for you, I think, being farther north. Yeah, we're a little further north, so we we wind up getting the the you know the the poof of the the buds on the trees and stuff usually about a week maybe week and a half past you so i'm i'm looking forward to that it's usually right around april 1st for us so yeah and also there's canada i mean they they throw their stuff at you canada throws their stuff at me canada also thinks they 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 <laughs> like vermont and new hampshire we all act like we individually invented maple syrup that is not obviously not the case <laughs> You know, we, we, we all can make it locally here. It's, it's fine. The syrup here is just as good as the syrup in Vermont, just as good as the syrup in Canada. It's like, but I'm sure I've offended everyone now by saying that. So that's, that's my goal for 2019 is an equal opportunity offender. So I've seen Connecticut syrup. It's nothing I'd, you know, advertise to the world, but Hey, yeah. And anybody can make it. If if you you have have maple trees and well, you need maple trees and then you need the right temperature right because uh-huh. it's got to be like thawing but not and 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 causing the sap to run and all that stuff it's actually pretty cool my kids elementary school had a um has they, they don't go there anymore but it still has a sugar shack at it where they would the kids would like that was part of their deal they would go out and uh tap the trees and stuff and you know do all that and then they would boil it down it's, it's actually really cool you know it's a, quaint right it's, it's good Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about all kinds of things, as I said. But um, I want to start, John, with Apple's announcements. Now, I say that today is Monday the 25th. Apple had a huge event this week. And there were some announcements there that we'll talk about because I think, you know, at some level they're they're relevant. But uh, the, the thing I really want to talk about is the new IMAX that they announced last week, which is, of course, an announcement since we've spoken together but uh man like so up until whatever it was last tuesday when they announced these these speed bumps on the imax the mac minis were the fastest desktop macs you can get right and it like the imac was not necessarily something uh that that you should buy that has changed and and in a very good way we uh John Martellaro and I went through and just like we did here for the the CPUs used in the Mac minis and in the uh and the MacBook Air at the end of 2018 we went through and found the CPUs that were used in the new iMac and uh those CPUs are pretty good uh in those new iMac especially the higher end ones which are I think there's there's one that's got uh Eight cores, and it's it's the i nine processor in the top end, twenty seven inch. Uh, it's a ninth gen processor. It's got eight cores, and it supports hyper threading, which means it can do sixteen threads, two threads per core. So for a lot of operations, not all of them, but lots of operations, it can actually you know do sixteen parallel tasks simultaneously. 
which wow. makes it and don't forget turbo smoking. boost up to five gigahertz correct the- that's right yeah yeah right it's a three gigahertz chip but it'll it'll turbo boost up um with that one that's so, a beast man it's a beast yeah it's interesting though right i mean and and so they bumped they bumped everything except the very 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 bottom of, of the line non-retina 21 and a half inch iMac that one's still the same as it was in 2017 the 2.3 gigahertz dual core uh uh seventh gen you know i5 or whatever it is in there but the rest of them Every, everybody got a speed bump either to an eighth gen or like I said, some of the top of the line ones not got ninth gen. That that just means what year they came out. The ninth gen ones literally just came out in Q1 of this year. The eighth gen ones came out about a year ago, but uh, still very relevant CPUs. And I'll put a link to the chart in the show notes if you want to really dig in and see, you know, what you get. But um, it's I, I'm impressed with with what they did. Uh, I'm curious to see like Geekbench scores so that we can actually compare it with something like the, you know, the the new uh, top of the line Mac Mini, which has a six core, twelve thread processor, right? But it's kind of interesting, John, because now you know, with that Mini being where it is, and for whatever it is, uh, twelve hundred bucks, you can get you know that CPU in the Mini. Uh, the question is, you know, is the iMac more is it too powerful you know is it more powerful well, than most people will need is the real question here's the differentiator i see between the two so most of the specs as far as the processor and stuff are pretty comparable okay as far as the cores and the speed and stuff like that right let, let, let's say that's a given but the thing, between the difference you're talking about between the mini and the the imac yes yeah, actually, well, the top of the line iMac is is quite a bit faster. But other than that, you're you're right. You're basically yeah, in the, a, a in the huge same ballpark. Overlap. The, the yes. difference that I do see is that some have an issue with the iMac or, or, or the Mac Mini. I'm sorry, um, having an embedded graphics chipset for Correct. a lot of people. If your needs, if, if you do the kind of work where you need graphics horsepower, or you are a big gamer, then that's the only thing that. The only problem that I see with the Mac Mini, though you can get an eGPU, and I think I saw a tweet you did the other day, which was like, you, you can get them starting at $500. So if you need that, but the thing is, why not just get an iMac that has a Radeon, you know, a big boy. Um, right. Called, well, because you know, graphic chipset, if because you it'll that, cost you then, more. <laughs> like, I still think you can yeah, buy the I, Mac Mini yeah. with the eGPU for less than than you get the iMac, right? Right. Uh, what I'm thinking is that for my next machine, so I have the 2014 Mac Mini. Right. And two screens, a 19, uh, two screens. So do I upgrade from my Mini to an iMac and then plug these two screens in, which I think I can through Thunderbolt or something like that? Right. So or I'm I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to burst your bubble a little bit here. Oh, no. I know. Na- none of your screens. That. I don't think you have any any Macs with um, Retina capabilities, right? So if you they're HD technically, but yeah, they're not. But right. that's not Retina, right? HD okay. is is one just very right, right. very big jump below Retina, right? Yes. No, I get that. Yeah, um, and so if you get say uh, you know one of these twenty seven inch Retina iMacs and you plug in a non Retina screen as a second screen. It's going to be a remote I've because I did it like I've I've experienced this. It's not a fun thing because you're looking at one screen and it's this gorgeous, you know, retina screen. And then you look at the other and it's like, oh, it's crap. You know, it it, it really highlights how bad a non retina okay. screen well, looks. I, I think so. I can take the trauma, but it's <laughs> well, technically but- possible. Oh, yeah. But you can also for, you know, I mean, you can go to like Dell or or even Monoprice. Right. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and get a uh, a, a oh, retina screen, a, a, yeah. you know, a retina. Well, no, it's called that, UHD, no, but, you're, you're, but yeah, but your your insight is valuable in the I mean, the the only retina screen I have right now, iPhone. And right. IPad, I think. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you want to buy a 4K screen to connect to your to your iMac or or frankly, even if you were to get a new Mac mini, I would also if, if someone was in your shoes, I would and they were they were they had the 2014 Mac mini 
with a, you know, whatever, a 1080p screen, HD screen or whatever, uh, I would I would actually recommend, get, you know, replace all of that with a new Mac mini hmm. and a 4K screen or it, we it's huh? it's called UHD, right? And it, the, the Apple's the only company that uses the word retina, but um, but, you know, it's that concept of having higher pixel mm. density than uh, than the eye can see. And it really makes a difference so in, a, yeah. in a big way. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ponder. It's not yet that time. The machines still do what I need. But <laughs> yeah, well, the that, that's OS, the thing, want- right? That's interesting. Well, the, the only thing is that the, the tech, uh, uh, definitely my MacBook Pro mid 2012 pre retina, non retina, yep, will not support the next OS officially. That they've they've said that much. They're like, right, and we a dude, and I'm like, oh man, yeah. I think the mid 2014 has a little more lifespan. I think they're going to give it a couple more years, but still, yeah, yeah. I mean, if it it supports metal, right? So that was sort of the big cutoff yeah. for Mojave. Um, my, you know, so when I saw these new iMacs, I thought, okay, when those come out on refurb later this year, I'll probably pick up one of those. My iMac in the office is a 2014. The iMac that I'm sitting in front of here now in the studio is a 2011. This one's, you know, I mean, it, at some point it's going to go. So it's, I'll, you know, I'll roll the office machine up here. I'll put the, I'll get one of the new iMacs most likely and put that down in the, uh, in the office and you know go from there so it's exciting though yeah and what's dave talking about when he says metal i'll tell you what he means so if you go into the apple menu and you say system information you then go to hardware and graphics slash displays you're going to see an entry saying metal and well hopefully it says supported which it does at least on this mac mini and uh i'm pretty sure on the macbook pro as well but um that's something you want to look for it's essentially Apple's n- new set of APIs that allow like super duper graphics stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, super duper graphics, but also uh, it just allows apps to talk directly to the GPU and almost directly to the GPU. So you can be certainly be used for graphics, but it can also be used for computational stuff that you know that that GPUs are really good at too. So like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that stuff. I like that stuff. That's that's to me. That's the the you know. I mean, for most people, non gamers, that's where the um, the benefits oh, like of the metal crypto are. stuff and like the uh, the mining stuff. Um, yeah. sure, that's one of the things. But really, any math. So, I mean, if you're there's a lot of things that will take advantage of metal, and and that is something to consider, right? With these IMAX, is yes. CPU wise, you know, you might be able to find one that's the same as the the Mac mini. But to your point, it's got, you know, this much more powerful GPU in the iMac. And so things like, uh, you know, Photoshop or or any sort of crunching like uh, that you're doing that's not using the CPU, if it's using the GPU. I don't know if Handbrake supports GPU or if the, and, and if that's faster. I think I remember trying Handbrake on the GPU a while back and it was I think it was not as efficient, but that may have changed now with, with faster GPUs and maybe even with metal. So yeah, there's all kinds of things where, where the, the GPU is used for very much non like graphics display mm. stuff. So yeah. 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 Fun. So I'm excited about that. Uh, at the end of last week's show, we talked about a little bit about the new iPad Air and iPad Mini. Those had just come out that day, um, and so I'm I'm uh, I'm excited about that. I'm I'm very glad to see the iPad Mini getting some love and like no compromises there. Right, it's the same chip that's in the iPhone XS and XR. Right, it's got the same amount of RAM as the XR. Um, which is fine. Three gigs. I think that that's probably enough and it supports the gen one Apple pencil like that. To me, that's really exciting. I, I have long been a fan of the iPad mini and uh, was sort of sad to see it move on. So I'm, I'm very glad to see it come back. So yes, yes, yes. Any thoughts about, uh, about that, John? 
they seem to be, uh, although more constrained than their Android competitors, it sounds like it, it's starting to get a bit confusing. Remember the bad old days when you had 20 models of performers? I do. It was like, what? It's like, it's like Gil Emilio all over again, man. <laughs> I'm starting to get the sense that... Uh, I think you and I understand the difference. If you do a bit of digging and they help you compare and they do a comparator and stuff like that, but, but it seems like they're starting to make the product line bordering on maybe a bit much for one to handle. You're talking about the iPad product line. Well, um, well, even the Mac product line, I mean, you know, all right, so yeah. you get the MacBook Pro, you got the MacBook, you got the MacBook Air, and it's like, and, and, and especially on the lower end, the MacBook Air, I think, and the MacBook have a, quite a bit of overlap. Yeah. And even with, the, you know, it's like, how do you. Yeah, fair. I, I, I think it's getting more difficult for, and we're good at this stuff, you and I, but even I have a problem. It's like, well, which one do I, do, do I get a MacBook Pro or the, Air? I mean, the Air I still, you know, it's like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, the processor is on the low end and stuff, but should I get it just a MacBook or a MacBook Pro? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I'm the only one that feels that way. Yeah. But, um, but, but I mean, it, it's not as bad as it used to be. Right. Right. It's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. But hey, it's a better tech for, uh, yeah, I, I like the um, I, I, I like I, I see. I think the iPad product line is is not quite as confused as the Mac product line. I, I, I mean, there's the iPad Pros and then there's the not iPad Pros, which is the Air and the Mini. Uh, arguably, I think if Apple hadn't used the name Mini in the past, it would be iPad Air, you know, ten and a half and iPad Air 7.9 or whatever, right? Because they're uh, 9.7, right? I can't remember which one they they went with. I, I yeah, I'm looking here. So, so right. the Air is 10.5, 10 the iPad okay. is 7, and the Mini is 7.9. It's like, yeah, yeah but that like so many different screen sizes. I mean, there's subtle differences in the other features as well. I'll, I'll, I'll agree. Sure, but but no, you've got Mini and 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 Air in the non-Pro category, and then you've got the Pro, right? Which yeah. is far more powerful. And far more pricey. And so I, I think in that in that realm, the iPads fit very well. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I think so. I, I like to me, that makes a lot of sense. And I like having that, you know, smaller form factor iPad mini. I, I think it's great. The fact that it's got that A12 in it. I think that's a good thing. Am I missing something on that? No, no, yes? no, no. OK. Someone in uh, my family has one. No, they love it. Yeah, no, it's great for uh, mostly reading news and stuff like that. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's yeah. I'm I I'm using a ten and a half inch iPad Pro, you know, previous gen, and it's fine. But I find it heavy for reading. It's a it's a little a little much for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Today's app, uh, we'll, we'll acknowledge that AirPods 2 came out. I don't know that there's a whole lot to say. I haven't tested them yet, uh, but obviously. Oh, what's it say? Like, what's different? What's hey, the, they they uh, have Hey S Lady support in them. Uh, and now, <laughs> well, that's that's actually, I mean, for people that use them all the time. No, that's no, a big that's deal. great. Yeah. I mean, everybody's integrating that. That's, that's Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then um, I, I guess they say. Battery life or better battery life. Or something. Yeah. Yeah, better battery life, and then you can get for either the AirPods Gen One or Gen Two, you can get the um, the the now the the Qi charging case, so that you don't have to plug it in. You can just throw them down on a Qi pad and and charge it up. So, right. so you know that's fine, right? It's all good. Um, I, I, evolution. It, it's evolution. Yeah, I, I I have no. There's nothing that I've heard of uh, that would indicate to me that sound quality has changed and and fit seems to be the same right if they if they both fit in the same case they're going to be the same form factor so now yep. it's interest i've noticed more than once now i've noticed several people wearing them when they're out and about like shopping and stuff like that but i've noticed some people only wearing one mm -hmm. which i think makes it easier for you to hear what's going on around you because that's sometimes important yeah, well, they. I, I even thought it was with, an interesting choice. It's like, hmm. 
even with two in, I can hear what's going on around me because they don't seal. But but mm. it not having uh, the, you know, the input into both ears it certainly helps, you know, be able to hear what's going on around you when I'm on the phone and they AirPods are by far the best Bluetooth headset I've ever used. Um, but uh, when I'm on the phone, I uh, I only use one at a time. And, mm. uh, oh, know, OK, that so they're really both well. mic'd, right? They both have mics in them. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which is great. And if I'm on a long call and I wind up, you know, burning out, if, if it starts yelling at me about the battery, it's like, OK, cool. I just put the other one in, wait until it pairs up, take the one that's that's <laughs> dying out and charge nice. that in the case. Well, I'm, yep. Nobody's the wiser. Yep. It's pretty good. All right. Um, Apple had their event today. I want to talk about that was that, just a media that circus. A little all bit. I have to but say. but we're going to wait. We're going to wait because the first thing I want to do is talk about our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. Now, the reason this is so timely and the reason I wanted to talk about it here in this segment of the show is because OWC already has pricing and kits available for the new 2019 27 inch iMac 5K RAM upgrades. And yes, the RAM in those iMacs is user upgradable, the same as it was in the previous iMacs. And boy, howdy, can you save some money from these people? Because you can get a 32 gig kit, so two 16 gig chips from OWC for $229.88 as of the price list they sent me for, uh, for today. That's 62% off the factory price. So that's, to me, worth it. Uh, you're getting, you know, RAM that's lifetime warranted because that's how OWC is. You're getting RAM that's tested, like totally trustworthy, and you're saving a ton of money. The 16 gig kit, which is two eight gigs, you save 40% versus the factory. The 64 gig kit, you save 55% versus the factory. And, and... OWC is testing qualification on a 128 gig kit. Um, they say that they can confirm that the system is able to see the 128 gigs installed, what they're doing. And this is what I love about OWC, right? They plugged it in. It works. They didn't stop there. They're continuing their testing to confirm that all the applications and Mac OS itself fully and reliably utilize the double factory maximum, right? Because the factory maximum is 64 gigs, which is 16 times four. They're obviously going double that and testing it. It's not uncommon at all for Macs to support more RAM than Apple says, but OWC is going through the motions and really like not just going through the motions. They're actually doing it and testing these things before they'll come out and certify it because they want to know that it's working the right way. And this is why John and I go to OWC anytime we need to upgrade our Macs. And you can too. Go to MacSales.com and, uh, and you're good to go. So you, you know, you're, you're in really good hands there. And our thanks to OWC at MacSales.com for sponsoring this episode. All right. Yeah. Today's why Apple event. Do that? Why what? did they misinform us? So I, yeah, I don't know, but I, it's, it's weird, right? Cause Apple always does that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, O W C. But yes, today's event. Today's event was, uh, different. I, so I think <laughs> my favorite part of it was the intro video, which which we have a link to. I think they put it on YouTube. It was like this really kind of old school. I mean, it certainly spoke to the, the nostalgic in me, right? It, you know where it was. It they showed the old rainbow Apple logo, and they they created this. Oh, but they this had the thing. rousing music, like yeah. the action music. You know, it was yeah. just like a. Very exciting list of people they were giving credit to for whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think at yeah. one point it was like a narration by S Lady. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, right. Like they, they the did a nice code, job. I don't know. It. You had a comment about but the dress code. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we were just messing around on Twitter. I, I noticed that most of the guys were wearing white soled shoes uh, where the color of the shoe matched the color of their shirt. So that was a very interesting thing. But just anyway, right. Yeah. Um, 
to me, you know, there were two things. There was a lot of fluff in this show and they trotted out a lot of celebrities that to me seem to be pitching yeah. their, their concept ideas to us, the public, when I think Apple already approved them all. So I, that was a little weird, but anyway, it's fine. You know, Apple celebrities, fine, whatever. Uh, there's two things that I'm, I'm trying to decide between them that uh, as to which I'm more excited about. So this Apple news plus thing, the $10 a month subscription that adds, uh, magazines and some newspapers. And of course they're trying to get more, uh, I think is, is a pretty powerful thing, you know, for 120 bucks a year, if they have everything that's of interest to you, that's a great price. Like it. And of course it puts it all on your iPad. And if you are part of a family group at same 10 bucks covers your family. Like, I think that's a, that's a big, big deal. Uh, and I, and I think it will, I think it's a big deal right out of the gate and I think it will continue to evolve and I hope it will continue to evolve. So um, I'm excited about news plus Th your thoughts on that, John. I think it's good to be, it'd be more compelling to me. Um, thing is here, you know, I'm in an area that's populated. So you would expect local news sources. So I applaud them having a greater presence of magazines and other content but um no i guess that's good that that, that they provide better access my, my the need i haven't seen fulfilled quite as well is local content so i, I agree and it would be great to see them uh to see them do that uh you know, I guess, you know, since most local content, most most people don't realize this, and it's certainly not true in every area, but most local newspapers have all sold out and are uh, actually most of them are pu published from a company in, in Dallas. There's there's one company, I can't think of the name of it, but that they publish most of the local news for the country and have, you know, correspondence in in local areas that obviously go and cover some events or whatever. But but it's all sort of handled through whatever this company's name in Dallas off the top of my head. I can't remember, but Tribune? Mm, is it Tribune? Oh, they're a big one too. They're, 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 they're yeah. a, a very large broadcasters throughout the country. Um, I don't think agendas, it's Tribune, I, but I think it begins with an S, but I, but it, you might be right about that, but okay, what, no, Tribune is in Chicago. Okay. Regardless, there, there are like a lot of local news. Isn't actually local companies producing it. And therefore, that means that Apple has to partner with less people to cover, you know, to to include the local news into this news plus thing. So I, I think there's a real possibility there uh, for for this to to work out. And I hope that Apple uh, and these companies can kind of work together on it, because I agree with you. Local mm -hmm. news would be would be very handy and it's something we really lose sight of, I, I feel like, in today's yes. world. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, otherwise, it's a you know, it's a portal to content which yeah. hey, that's always good if uh somebody gets paid and <laughs> right right yeah, yeah. It, exactly yeah and they highlighted some you know pretty well-known publications that are part of the club so uh so it looks yeah if you want to bundle your your news yeah. i mean i i usually go to aggregators like you know news.google.com or news.yahoo.com which you know gives you a mix as well but they're they're doing it for you and actually i do I, I see more and more people tweeting Apple news links uh, for articles rather than directly yes. to the site. So, yeah. So, so it looks like the platform does, and I even use the, uh, you know, which I guess is an extension of it. Their uh, uh, stock app has business news, which I think is sure. part of the news feed. And actually I find that quite useful. Uh, yeah. That app is, uh, is pretty good. And so, so there's that. And, and I think that's is now available as part of uh, iOS 12.2 and Mac OS 10.14. I want to say four, if I'm remembering correctly. Oh. And those are out now. Uh, I have not installed Mac OS 10.14.4. I have installed iOS 12.2, but I uh, haven't really played with it yet because we've been, you know, recording this show. Uh, Sinclair, thanks to Alex in there the chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream, where uh, where he has answered our question about the company that's publishing news in, in Dallas. I'm pretty sure you're right, Media Alex. Conglomerates. Yeah, Sinclair. Uh, but the other thing that really made a difference, 
I think today is this announcement of Apple pay for transit starting to roll out in the U S I think Portland is going to be the first one, Portland, Oregon, uh, which is the Portland. Most people think of, I live an hour from Portland, Maine. So I always ask, but uh, Portland, Oregon is where it's going to roll it out. And then New York city and Chicago later this year, and hopefully more U S cities after that. So, I think a lot of I think this is lost on a lot of folks here in the U.S. If you haven't experienced it elsewhere, uh, it it's fantastic. So uh, when we went to London a few years ago, they have had it on the tube and and really all of their public transit. And what was fantastic is we got off the plane and we were able to ride the the tube, which is their trains, their subways, essentially, and uh, and their buses without needing to go and get like anything. We didn't even need to go get currency, let alone, you know, a, a Metro card or a tube card or anything like that, which they call an Oyster card. Uh, you just use Apple pay. And it, the cool part there is that, you know, you get discounts for riding more frequently or whatever. And with your Apple pay, those discounts just automatically, you know, it, it knows that you calculate up uh, one tip for anybody that's traveling in London or using it in London, your Apple pay, um, each device that you have generates a different number, credit card number for your credit card on Apple pay on that device. So even if you're using the same credit card on your phone and on your watch, they will have different numbers. And therefore, at least in London, uh, you'll, they, they are treated as different accounts because they are different account numbers. So just bear that in mind. But, um, but being able to, you know, being able to use this in, in, you know, cities, like I'm very much looking forward to when it comes to New York, it'd be obviously I'd be excited if it came to Boston too. I, I think it, it makes a big difference for folks that live there, but I especially think it makes a big difference for tourists or people that are there just occasionally, you know, you go to, I, anytime I go to New York, it's like, Oh, where's my, my Metro car. Like I got to find this thing and I don't know how much money it has on it. So I've got to check and it's just a, you know, it's just an added hassle. Whereas I just and even worse, get on the train. Now here's the go. thing. Yeah. So MTA runs both the train in Connecticut and the subway, but you have to use different cards. It's like, yeah. and the stupid thing is you can even buy a combination train ticket slash Metro card from the dispensers on the platform. Why are there two different ways to pay for it? It's all the same line. It's like a cooperative between us yeah. and, and, and New York. So it's like, why are there two different ways to pay for it? And then we have our city bus system. I, same I, thing. I, I don't CT know transit, that, I don't know that Apple have, Pay is going to solve this problem. I, in fact, I'm. I no, would, no, it's it's local yeah. governments or, or bureaucracy that has to figure it out. Because you could. I mean, th th there's no. I mean, we pay for our train. You, you've used the app. I pay for my train ticket with Apple Pay. So why can't I just do it directly? Why do I have to go through sure. stupid app? Well, they need to, like, they'll need to, on the subways and everything, th well, this is an infrastructure yeah. change, right? They need to put NFC readers on all of the the trains and, and or turnstiles at the very least, you know, d depending on yeah. what okay. you're talking no, about. I got, the ex I got the expense and the logistics. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's a logistical thing, but it works out really, really well. Um, somebody, Al I think it was Alex in the in the chat room earlier was saying that, uh, Japan's had it for a long time too, and it's fantastic there as well. So, yeah, it's good stuff. It's good just stuff. Swipe and go, man, or tap that, and go. Tap and go. That's that is what it is. Yeah, you just get on. Yeah, you just don't mess with it. You're good to go. Oh, it it. I think it's it's fantastic. Yeah, that's good. All right, we have some questions to answer, and uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's get to them. Actually, the uh, the the next thing that I would like to do, though, John is uh, I want to talk about our next sponsor, if that's okay by you. Absolutely. All right. Look, John and I are very blessed when it comes to the thick, lush hair that we have on our heads. We know we're fortunate in that regard, and we know that many of you are not, and that's why I'm happy that we were able to partner with our sponsor, Hair Club, at hairclub.com slash MGG, where you can go today to get a free hair analysis and a free take home hair care kit. Confidence is important, right? And sometimes one change like this can make all the difference. Hair club knows this. 
And that's why they're inviting you to become part of the hair club family to see how getting the most out of your hair can change your life. They understand the emotions that you're feeling. They know the questions that you have. And they're the leader in total hair solutions with a legacy of success for over 40 years. So whether you're looking to revitalize the growth of your own hair or to learn more about the latest proven methods for hair replacement or restoration, you know, hair clubs does all of this. And they're professionally trained stylists, hair health experts and consultants will craft a personalized solution for you so that you feel your best and get the most out of your hair. And you can see for yourself just how powerful great hair can be. Go to hairclub.com slash MGD today for that free hair analysis and that free take home hair care kit, all valued at over 300 bucks. That's hairclub.com slash MGG for that free hair analysis and free hair care kit. One more time with feeling hairclub.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Hair Club for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Let's go to Joe, shall we? Joe <sighs> says, my question is about a bad key on a friend's MacBook Pro mid-2012. One key does not work, and I'm wondering if there's a place I can get one. I'd rather not go through the effort to install an entire new keyboard. Thanks for any suggestions. Yeah, so I found I, I've never had to buy one, uh, but I did find a company at replacementlaptopkeys.com. And there is a link there at slash MacBook. So I will put a link there. Uh, they seem legit based on where I, I found out about them and, and all that stuff. Uh, I can't promise anything, of course, but because we haven't used it, but it sure seems like a good place to, uh, to go. So who, who? what's that? Who's that? Replacementlaptopkeys.com. Oh, so. okay. No, they're good. Yeah. You've used I, them. I, oh. Well, no, but I search in Google and they come up. Okay. As an ad, so. Yeah, right. They they look they look If good. they were thieves, you would think that Google wouldn't, you know, post their ads. Sure. Um <laughs> they, they the 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 trick of course No, they they've come up in the past. Yeah. I mean it's a it's a tall order. I mean I've, I've as you recall, I replaced the keyboard one time, but that's like Sure. That could be like a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, more. exactly. Exactly. It could be uh, a pain in the neck, if not impossible on some machines, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Macworld UK has an article uh, detailing how to pop keys off of a keyboard and put them back in. That's it's sort of a tricky process if it's got that little butterfly under, under it or whatever, you know, whatever it is for your laptop. I would actually recommend taking the key off first before you order a new one. And, uh, and just make sure that it's not that just that some debris or gook or whatever has gotten in there because you might take it apart and realize you can actually fix this without a new key, but you might need the new key. And that's where that's where replacement laptop keys comes from. So, so, yeah, the mechanism is really weird. It's usually a combination of little posts and yeah, I don't know what to call them, but, yeah. but it can get. I mean, it, it's usually designed so you can usually pop it out and pop it in without much effort. But you got to get the alignment right. You got to get it right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not altogether fun. Um, but you know, it, it can work. Apple's got. Uh, Apple's got. Uh, they've also got a keyboard service program for MacBook and MacBook Pros, but they, that that's not going to affect um, Joe here or Joe's friend. That only goes back as far as the early 2015 laptops, mm. but I'll put a link to that here in the, uh, in okay. the show notes too, just in case anybody else is, is having <laughs> that. But then last week I actually thought that my keyboard was broken, but I'll uh -oh. tell you what I did. What'd you, you do? Like to know what I did. Um, you can accidentally activate mouse keys on a Mac. Oh, mouse keys is an assistive mode where it replaces the trackpad with keyboard equivalents. The thing is, if you have this engaged and you don't know it, it would appear that your keyboard and trackpad are failing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you hit certain, and I was like, wait, the M key doesn't work. It's like, what? And then I'm like, all right, let me log in as another user. And I did. And it's like, oh, now it works. And I'm like, okay, it's software. It's not hardware. It's software. Now I got to figure out what I screwed up. And eventually I, 
I found the uh, solution. But um, if you ever run into this, I've, I've, I've happened had it happen like twice to me. Huh? Right. <laughs> accident. I, I think it, if you hit the uh, shift key five times, that mm-hmm. does it. Who knows? You may accidentally do that. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. No, that's a good thing to know. That's right. Yeah. 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 Disabling mouse keys. We'll put a we'll put a link in the show notes. I think Apple's got an article about this. Um, <laughs> I can't be the only one. You know, I'm sure you're not the only one. That's yeah, 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 yeah. There. Well, Apple doesn't have an article, but somebody else does. So I'll put a I'll put a link to that. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, we, we 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 talked about the media event today, so we've got a couple of media questions. Jurgen asks. Uh, He says, I'm afraid I messed up big time. I'm a big music lover and have many, many hundreds of CDs. I ripped them all in the past and converted them to MP3. When Apple Music was introduced, I subscribed and had it analyze my whole library. Since I was convinced that Apple Music, Apple loves music and would do a better job in converting the songs, I swapped out all of my songs to the Apple Music matched version. Okay, that's fine. After this initial step, all the songs had either matched or uploaded as iCloud status. And everything was fine up until last week when I looked at the iCloud status of some of my songs. I haven't done that for years and was shocked at what I saw. There are now many, many songs that have no iCloud status at all or are listed as no longer available. They still play fine in iTunes on my computer where the library is located because I have the files, but they don't play on other devices via Apple Music. Did I make a mistake in deleting my own versions and replacing them with Apple Music? Is there a way to convert those Apple Music versions that are still on my local hard disk into versions that are no longer connected to Apple Music? Or do I have to dig deep and search the box with an old hard drive to see if I'm lucky and have an old backup? So I think you're going to be okay, Jurgen. Um, if these songs are matched or were matched uh, and maybe aren't anymore, then I think you're going to be fine as long as you have the the files that you downloaded from Apple. Um, look in song info and for anybody else following along, uh, highlight a song, then go to the edit menu, go to song info and look at the file tab, which is the one all the way to the right. If kind is listed as a matched AAC audio file, you're OK. However, if it's listed as Apple Music AAC audio file, then that indicates that it's DRM. Uh, it has, you know, some copy protection on it and only will work on that computer in iTunes or, or maybe QuickTime, but I don't think so. I think it's gotta be iTunes. Um, but I don't, I think if they were matched they're you're, you're not going to see that they're just going to be matched files that you downloaded from Apple with no DRM whatsoever. So I think you're okay. Um, those files are able to be played anywhere that AAC files can be played. But if you want to convert them into something else, first go to iTunes, Preferences, General. And in the section about CDs, it says like when a CD is inserted, there's an import settings button. Click that. Choose your import format there. Choose the format that you want to convert these files to there. It could be Apple Lossless. It could be MP3. You get to set all your options. Hit OK. And I think you have to hit OK again to get back to the the list. Now, highlight the song or songs that you want to convert, go to the file menu and choose convert. And the last option in the menu should offer to convert it to, for example, Apple lossless if you chose Apple lossless or MP3 if you chose MP3 and it will convert those. Um, And that should do it. You might also be able to do this without converting the songs. I think you'd have to like take the songs and, and like, copy them somewhere so you don't lose the song files and then remove them from your Apple music library so that it removes them, not just from your computer, but from everywhere. And then re add these songs back in. I think it will upload them because it's not going to be able to match them anymore. And once you do that, then your other devices should be able to get them. I think so. Those are my thoughts on this, John. Any thoughts by, uh, by you, my friend? Uh, the hoops that you recommend we jump through sound to be about the best solution possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, Unfortunately, it, you have to go that way, but yeah, I, I, I'm guessing what happened. I should check my stuff too. I'm guessing what happened with Jurgen's songs is there are songs that Apple did have 
the rights to, you know, have as part of Apple music and now doesn't for whatever reason anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Craziness. It's crazy. I haven't seen that on mine, but I honestly haven't looked. So I could be, I could be wrong on this. You want to take us to Colby, my friend. Here's a head scratcher from Colby. And I'm going to try to condense this here. He okay. Was very specific. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, so he has, a, a, but, but the relevant parts here, I think. So Apple TV fourth generation. Here's the problem. There's an app that you can run on this generation Apple TV. I do not have this. I have the third generation, which didn't support apps, but the fourth generation does. So here's the problem. Um, at one point, he signed up for DirecTV, which typically, last I checked, Dave, is a satellite service. But I guess they also offer an app. Where you can tune their stuff in, which a lot of other people do this HBO and all, all these guys, right? Yeah. Um, here's the problem, though, is that he, when he runs the app, um, sometimes it'll feed local channels for one area of, uh, the, so he's in the state of Colorado, but it'll feed him local channels from an area that is not his local area. So then he was like, well, what about location services and I actually searched around? And apparently this is a problem that they tried to address a year ago where their app. Um, and the, uh, so it's an Apple TV fourth generation thing, kind of, because that model has location services. Mine does not. I'm actually not sure. You, you know, I was digging around on mine to try to find out how does it know where it is? And like if I ran weather.com, it'd be like, yeah. so somehow it knows probably due to my IP address. And I think that's what they're using. And confusing with his service, because I think he suspects that a lot of times his IP address changes. Sometimes it may be located where your ISP is. And not, and I think that's what's happening here, is that it's confusing the IP. So the thing is, I think it's a bug in their app. <laughs> it's like, guys, you have to be able to figure out the local channel lineup. But the, 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 he mentioned that his iPad and his uh, iPhone, which I guess also run the app, are, are able to do this properly. But I think the reason... That's the case, Dave, is that they have GPS and the Apple TV does not. So even the right. location services tries to do the best it can. If if there's no and, and there's no GPS chip last I checked in the Apple TV fourth generation. I don't, I don't even I don't even know. Have you messed with that setting on yours? I, I haven't you have one, right? I do, but I've never run into this problem. So I haven't I haven't had to dig. But I, I think your I think your analysis of this is spot on that. You know, the Apple TV can only get location information from IP address. Like that's that's the and only the apps that you run on yours, whether they be built in or or third party. You you've never had a, a geocoding error. No, I I mean I've <laughs> definitely run apps that care about geocoding. Like for example, you get different options on Netflix if you're in the U.S. versus you know for example in London or or whatever, right? You know, there's just different things that Netflix can stream to you. But like like it gets my I I my guess is that it's getting my location wrong because i i've seen it you know i've looked up my ip and sometimes it says it's two towns north of me and sometimes it says it's like you know 40 minutes south of me in massachusetts but both of those are you know still in the united states so it's it's granular enough that it doesn't matter you know what i mean so you've never I, been denied access to content no which is how, that's what's happening here because you know like especially sports i think have yeah black and stuff like that. And if you're in the wrong area, it's like, well, I should be able to watch this. Why can't I? Yeah, no, that's I think that's I think you're right. Yeah, the IP address. And honestly, I, I mean, there's no other way for for an app to on the Apple TV to get location information because the, the Apple TV doesn't have a GPS in it. So it has to use IP. But maybe, maybe there's a hidden GPS. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think there is. Well, remember that? Well, remember, oh, remember back in the day, I think it was the iPod, there was yeah, an iPod Touch. That's right. That's that right. They had not initially enabled the Bluetooth radio in it. And then once they released an iOS update, it was like, what? Yeah, Look that's right. From us. Yeah. So maybe there is, we just don't know about it. It's Apple. Let us know. Maybe it's possible. I mean, it could be baked into the Wi Fi chipset or something, but getting GPS signals oh. inside your house would yeah, also be awful. 
And if you want to, if you want to send us an anonymous tip or a piece of information, Dave, you know, you could send it to feedback at macgeekab.com. You could go to feedback at macgeekab.com just in case John's speaking too quietly for you. It's feedback. Right. And like my good friend said, and I'm going to speak up here, feedback at macgeekab.com. So, yeah, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that there's a perfect solution. I know DirecTV is probably under contracts with, you know, the providers to not let this stuff leak beyond the right areas, but it's not uncommon at all. Is that it? There's a contract that, okay, yeah. you can't broadcast this content in this area. Because That's exactly we right. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Stupid. Well, they have the rights. I mean, well, they have the rights to broadcast in a certain area. It's just how, like, it's how those things work. So... But I don't I don't know that there's a better answer here because Internet service providers routinely <laughs> like they get, you know, they use blocks of IP addresses and they, you know, like I said, I mean, I've right, seen right. it where my IP address is, says it's I'm was, in Lowell, Massachusetts. My, yeah. Well, here was my awful answer is stream the content from your iPhone or your iPad to your Apple TV. You could. But that's not the way you should have to solve this problem. That's right. So Alex in the chat room is curious. Uh, and thank you, Alex. You're, you've been, I know there's others that have been uh, vocal today too, but mm-hmm. it seems like Alex has the, the timely information. Uh, he, uh, he suggests either if you're using a VPN for your entire network, turn it off because that will, you know, mislead the, the geo fencing or the geo detection. And if you're not, Maybe you should use a VPN for your entire network so that you can target it to be at, you know, in certain right. places. Yeah. I didn't mention this, but he, he mentioned that when he's using his iOS devices, he is using uh, uh, one of our sponsors, uh, ExpressVPN. I believe. Ah, yeah. Well, so, but on, iOS uh, will so, bypass. Uh, but he says it uh, right in that I think the, the GPS chip is. That's exactly is prioritized. That's right. And reported location. Yeah, that's right. So that's why that's working. Yeah. So a GP, a, a VPN could break this or fix it, you know, but it, it alters oh, that. What if you get, what if he, do they make express VPN for Apple TV? Hmm. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. That would be interesting I mean, though. It's, right. It's yeah. Like iOS. I mean, it's kind of iOS, right? Oh, it is iOS. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Different features. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Keith had a really interesting question earlier today and uh and and I'm actually very, really happy that we got a solution. It's it's imperfect, but sometimes imperfect is better than nothing at all. So Keith writes, he says I need to nuke and pave my iPad Pro and start from scratch, not restoring from a backup. Okay. He says, however, I would like to keep my lock screen image and my main wallpaper image the same but I can't find the originals because I first set these up on an original iPad. I've long since lost. Uh, They may be buried in my photos library, but that has over 20,000 images. And although I've looked, I can't find them. What I really want to do is save them so that I can put them back after I've blitzed the iPad, but I'm struggling. He says, I bought amazing some time ago on your recommendations, but I can't find anything in there, which will allow me to save the lock and home background images but perhaps I'm missing it. Can you help? So uh, the answer is thankfully, yes. Uh, I found a couple of posts, uh, one on Stack Exchange that seems really, really helpful um, that talk about a few ways that it, in a, including digging into the backups. Um, it, th- and these files are stored in the backups. And the Stack Exchange article sort of talks about how to dig into Apple's backups and and find them. Uh, your, uh, it, but it's, it's buried. Now here's the thing though. If, even if you get them out of there, they are, they are saved in a format, uh, called CP bitmap. And the presumption is, um, that this is, um, because of the perspective and cropping and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so that, you know, makes things interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a minute here, but, uh, but in any event, iMazing can do this. Uh, I talked to the folks at iMazing and they said, you go into file system, which you can do with your backups in iMazing and you go to backup home domain library springboard. And there's 
files in there. There are JPEG files and these CP bitmap files. You want the CP bitmap files. The JPEG files are just thumbnails. So that that's not going to make you happy. But you pull these CP bitmaps out. However, uh, and then there's uh, actually there's there's two sets of CP bitmaps. One is um, one set is labeled with original and that's the non cropped versions, right? Cause you can take these and crop them when you make them your background image. So take the non cropped versions and they're going to be big tens of mm. megabytes a piece. And then you need to convert them. And I, I hear you whipping out your knife to peel another layer of this onion. Continue. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> because graphic converter says it will read CP bitmap images, but it won't not these because Keith tried. And Keith failed. Well, he failed with graphic convert. Graphic converter failed. Keith did not fail because Keith kept going and Keith found a way using a couple of terminal commands to convert these images. And then Keith went to the next level and Keith posted in our forums how to do exactly all of this. So we'll put a link to the, the, our, the, post that he put in our forums and and it solves this i'm not going to talk through the the conversion because it's it, it it's not gonna it's not gonna matter if i talk it through it's better to read terminal commands and and all of this so and he's even put the amazing locations and all that in there so you don't need to remember any of this you just need to know that there's a post on the mac geek gab forums that talks about how to use amazing to extract your background and uh and lock screen images and turn them because what you need to do is even though your, your new iPad or your iPad, you know, your fresh install on your iPad is going to want these as CP bitmaps in the end, or it's going to turn them into them. It doesn't want them as CP bitmaps. You have to feed them to them as JPEGs. So you need to get them back into JPEG format so that you can feed them to your iPad so that it can do this magic again. So fun stuff, huh? Mr. Braun. I think I learned about 12 new things there. Yeah, exactly. In one <laughs> question. That's right. <laughs> what a mess. Yeah. Who's responsible for this outrage. I uh, yeah, it's interesting that this is like that there's no way <laughs> to just prove this. Export these this. out. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I've found myself in this scenario before and I've just I've punted like if I'm going to wipe a device it's like, "Oh man, so I why, love why that." Why are you image. using a special proprietary It's not proprietary. It's just format. special. It's just, but CP it's, bitmap? I've never heard of it. JPEG it's, I've heard of. Okay. But it's not but, proprietary. There's a difference between uncommon and proprietary. Uh, it's uncommon. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. 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 But still. <laughs> yeah. I, it's crazy. <sighs> so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What but you know, so what's there you next? go. What's next? Oh, yeah. uh, let's see. What's After next? All this, What's that? Uh, you know what I want to do next is I want to talk about our uh, our third sponsor for this episode, if uh, if that's OK by you. Outstanding. All right. We all know how much fun it is to manage our own devices. Right. I mean, let's face it. We enjoy that stuff at some level, but at some level we don't. And when it stops getting fun at all, it was when we have to. Manage other people's devices. Well, Jamf can change that for you with Jamf Now because Jamf Now makes it easy to set up, manage, and protect not only your Apple devices, but the devices for all of the folks that work for you and that you have to support. The people that you're responsible for in your organization or maybe your clients. This is what Jamf is for. You can check your digital inventory. You can distribute Wi-Fi and email settings. You can deploy apps, enforce passcodes, protect company data. You can even lock or wipe a device as needed from anywhere with Jamf now. It helps you manage your devices so you can focus on your business instead. This is the trick, right? There's only so much time in the day and you need to be efficient about everything that you're doing. When it comes to tech support and managing devices, man, that can be a time sink. Even just syncing time with the person to do it, to get in the same place with Jamf now, you don't have to because you can remotely keep track of your own Macs, your own iPads, your own iPhones, but also all of those for the folks that you need to take care of. And what's even cooler Mac Geekab listeners can start securing your business today by managing your first three devices for free. 
you can add more starting at just two bucks a month per device. Now there's a special URL you have to go to go create your free account today at jamf.com slash MGG. That's J A M F.com slash M G G and take your efficiency back into your own hands. Trust me, you will love this and it's free to start going and, and actually free for your first three devices forever. J A M F.com slash M G G our thanks to jamf now for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, we talked about European travel and, you know, like people are planning their vacations now. In fact, I'm I got, I got two text messages while we're doing this episode from two people asking me questions about, Hey, what about this? And what about that? In addition to having already prepped this, uh, this question from listener David. So I, uh, David asks very simply, I'm going to Central Europe. He's going to Rom Romania and Mondo Moldova this summer. He says, what things should I take into consideration? Sims, data, power, etc." So um, we talked about this when I did that European trip that I mentioned, but that was three years ago on Mac Geek 614. And we'll put a link to 614 in the show notes for sure. Uh, however, uh, and, and, but not much has changed. Some things have changed. Really what's changed is cellular stuff. So let's talk about that. Power is easy. Pa that, that's probably the last. You're right. Yeah. Power hasn't changed. Last that's right. Time, last I checked. Yeah. Power hasn't changed. Um, most adapters. And if not, I think 12 South is, is one of our favorite companies. I wouldn't go to 12 themselves. South. I, I, I would, I have a much better option for people. I mean, not that I wouldn't go to 12 South. It's that I would go to Rick Steve's first. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Because I got a 12 South one that's worked for me, but Apple also offers an adapter kit. Yeah. The problem with those is they're all customized to one type of device, right? You know, like the 12 South one is only for your laptop, you know, deal. Um, you don't, oh, okay. you don't need to, um, you don't need to con most of our devices don't require us to convert the power. They just require us to adapt the plug. Yes. And, yes. and, and that's, that's the important thing to remember, like your power supplies for your iPhone and your Macs and really everything except like a hairdryer and a curling iron, which I'm going to advise you simply not bring with you. And, <laughs> uh, no, because it's like, well, they're high powered and it's a, uh, it, the conversion is more difficult, I think, to get a way good. more difficult. You're going to you're going it, to it would be cheaper to just buy a hairdryer when you get there. But chances are wherever you're staying is probably going to have one, you know, um, but right. in terms but of I'm your, with you, when you, you look at the adapter you have and you look at the voltage and the amperage range, mm -hmm. you see what the input says. And if it says 120 to 240, then you're probably good. Yep. And the frequency, of course, that that's usually different. right. It's got to go Slightly between different. 50 and 60 hertz. That's right. Yep. Um so, but your, you know, your Mac adapters, your iPhone adapters, your little chargers or whatever, those are fine. So really all you need to do is adapt the plug and Rick Steve's store. They still have them. I, I bought them when I went years ago, they have adapters for all the different, you know, countries and types for a buck a piece. They're not voltage converters. They're just adapters. Oh, okay. But so I bought, there were four of us going. So I bought four of each so that we each had one there was never a scenario where we were using all four, but it was handy to have, you know, and, and I wound up buying, uh, we, you know, we went to, we were in Barcelona, Paris and, and London. And so Barcelona and Paris both used what, what's called the continental Europe, uh, plugs. And then in the UK, they use a completely different thing. And so I had to buy a, a second set of adapters for that, but they were all like a buck a piece. So, don't drive yourself crazy with with all the the expensive stuff. Just go to go to Rick Steve's buy the uh, you know just buy the stuff you need. I've loaned these out to friends because you know I don't need them if I'm at home, <laughs> and they've worked flawlessly right, for everybody. Right. Yep, it really is just. I mean, you could build your own. I don't recommend that, um, mm -hmm. but but you could you know because it really is just okay. adapt adapting. That's all. Yeah. No, no. Good advice. The the other. People mentioned offer a subset of this, but it sounds like they offer it all for a really good price. So, yeah, okay. yeah, it's great. Yeah, they're it's great. Yeah, exactly. Now, yep. the nightmare is phone and data services. And I'll, I'll let you lead with that, because I the, the, the last time I did that, I had a Verizon. Uh, I was in Paris and I had a Verizon 
smartphone CDMA, which is oh. not popular overseas. And I actually got a like extension phone. They offered a way for me to to get a phone that was like forwarded from my other phone. Sure. That I could take and receive calls when I was in Paris. Um, and it wasn't terribly expensive, of course. Now, I mean, I, I still don't think that's an issue with CDMA, like you know, CDMA Verizon doesn't exist the, in Europe. Yeah. Well, so. well, in that the phones handle both uh, GSM right, Cor- and CDMA. And, yeah, yeah, and my LT- phone speaks both. And LTE. And LTE. Yeah. That, so, right. So you, you need to be using a phone that supports GSM and, L- and or LTE uh, to, to be able to work in Europe. That From that forward, you then need to decide, do you want to use your existing US-based carrier while you're there or do you just want to get a sim while you're there and use a you know one of the a european carrier the the downside to using a you know a, a different sim of course is your your phone number changes while you're there you you get this the phone number of that sim um, but the benefit is cost right so if you're a t-mobile subscriber and it's worth checking with whoever your your provider is but T-Mobile for for most of their plans offers essentially free roaming. I don't want to say worldwide because I'm sure there's places where they don't. But most of the places that that any one in the U.S. would consider traveling to on a regular basis, the, and it's like in the hundreds, the number of countries. It's just included. Doesn't cost you any extra. You use your minutes and your data while you're traveling, and you're good to go. However, if you're not with T-Mobile. Uh, Verizon and AT&T kind of screw you. I think AT&T <laughs> screws you more, but it might not be any different. AT&T, you can pay 10 bucks a day per device. So if you're traveling with a family of four, this starts to get really expensive really fast. Uh, but now. Yes. Question. Yeah. The newer X series iPhones support dual SIMs. Correct. Their way to retain your existing number and add a data SIM, a data eSIM, is that possible? Yes. This? That, oh, that's, okay. that's, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's, so that's, that's the other way to go is to, to, um, now we say these phones are dual SIM. They don't actually, unless you bought it in China, they don't actually let you put two SIMs in, but they do let you use the eSIM. And many, many carriers will let you will support the eSIM and uh, and you can just sign up for service in whatever country you're in uh, and assign it to your second SIM. Now, you you need to be really careful, though, that you're not using your U.S. based SIM for data or texting or calls while you're there because you're going to be paying whatever these roaming fees are. And they're you know, it's going to that's going to add up. Uh, but you can have it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, it just depends on on whether convenience, you know, where where you fall on the that that spectrum of do you need, you know, do you want the convenience of having the same phone number while you're in Europe? You probably don't care uh, for the most part. There's one place where you might care, and that's texting. And that's why years ago I set my phone to do all of my iMessages from my email address, not from my phone number, because that way, when we traveled to Europe, it was no big deal. It was just, oh well, yeah, people still, I messaged me. It was fine. No, no problem. Uh, because if people, I messaged my phone number, I would not get that while I was in Europe, but I would get I messages hmm. to my, to my email. Yeah. So, but for regular texting, you know, the green bubble people for us, iPhone folks, uh, that will not work. So it depends on how important that is. And it really, when we were there, the only time it was important, there, there was a, we were in Paris uh, on, uh, on uh, their Bastille day is what we call it here, but it's their fit, the national, I think, but you know, their, their version of the U S is 4th of July, uh, their independence day. And I think I'm not misclassifying that. And if I am, I'm, I'm sorry. We were there in Paris and there was a, a bombing, I think, in, in Nice that day. And so people, friends at home were naturally concerned. And we had some folks that were texting us and couldn't get us because we didn't have our AT&T Sims in our phones. They were in a little baggie in my bag, you know, uh, so we didn't get those texts until we you know, got home. But other than that, it really didn't matter. Uh, so but I but. 
there is one scenario that you need to think about if you're going to just go with, you know, essentially turning off or, or removing your U.S. SIM and using a European SIM. Because you it, money wise, you know, you can get a, a 30 day SIM for like 20 bucks uh, and you're good to go, you know, throughout Europe. So, you, you know, it cost wise, it's way cheaper to just get a SIM. You can you can do it with the eSIM or you can get a SIM, you know, when you get off the plane in the airports, they have them. The, the deal is you have to buy these SIMs and the service in when you're in the country. There's no way for them to sell it to you uh, before you, you know, before you leave the U.S. So that gets a little weird. Uh, but otherwise, it's, you know, it's fine. Um, however, once you get this new SIM, you are probably going to want to use Uber and Lyft while you are there. And I didn't think about this until it happened. And then I thought about it. But Uber and Lyft have your phone number tied to your account so that your driver can text and or call you. They will not be texting or calling you if Uber still has your U.S. based number in your account. So as soon as you get your new <sighs> phone number in whatever country you're in, go into the Uber app, go into the Lyft app and reauthenticate that number. It'll probably text you something and you you know type in the code like you always do and, and then you're good to go. And set yourself a calendar reminder to undo that when you get back home, because you will run into the same problem didn't coming we, back. Didn't we just talk about this? Why do you have so many problems finding out where I am? It's so easy. And I'm not sure what it, you're saying. Right? <clears throat> they're not having trouble finding where you are. It's that well, if no, they the want to call they're you. Use, they're using a flawed. What? They should be able to figure out where you are and where to call you. In the, in no, the, you're missing this. Yeah. They, they can totally Uber knows where you are. It uses GPS. But if your driver wants to call you, they call the number that Uber has on file. And if that number is not the number that's assigned to your phone at that moment, the, the call will not ah, go through. All right. If you assign it to the SIM, that, uh, I understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not a location thing. It's, it's just like, it's literally a phone number. The number thing. on file. And Correct. actually I've been, I've been, playing with T-Mobile about my data SIM and my right, right. iPad and they're, they're still having problems because they're like, who are you? And it's like, well, here, I mean, here's the number. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've got to, you've got to assign the, you just need to make sure that Uber and Lyft have your, right. have your numbers. And, and that's other than that, I, I think you're going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, another point. service to, to think about is a service called gig sky, they are eSIM, Apple SIM compatible. So if you've got a dual oh, SIM okay. iPhone, you can use GigSky. GigSky for data only. They don't have voice service. But to your point, John, makes it really easy. You can do it all right inside your phone. You don't have to bother getting a SIM. It's all right there. And you can just, you know, sign right up. So um, we've used GigSky before and it's fantastic at G-I-G-S-K-Y dot com. We'll put a link in the in the show notes to that, too. So, Yeah. Anything more on this one? Time to move on. I don't know where we are. No, I I don't have any uh, big travel coming up. Cool. Yeah, I don't. Chicago, I, maybe. I don't think I do either. Or Manhattan. Actually, there's a, a new show. You may have gotten an email about it. Cool. I I didn't. I don't know. I but hey. sure. What's the name of the show? Oh, it's some uh, uh, blockchain. Some security thing. It's a oh. it's a, a new uh, I think Showstoppers thing. Ah. It's like hey, we're doing a security kind of thing. Cool. In New York sometime and i'm like okay cool <laughs> um one i think we've got oh i i do want to remind everyone send in your mail workflows to us we told you how to find us uh of course but um that uh we asked last episode we've gotten some great workflows from you folks and i, I think we're going to have a lot of fun kind of sharing these and distilling them down together and and you know perhaps increasing the efficiency of of the workflows we all use. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, but send them to us. We already told you the email address, uh, but if you're a premium subscriber, you can, uh, you can email us at premium at MacGeekGab.com. And if you're not a premium subscriber and you want to learn about it, you can visit us at MacGeekGab.com slash premium. And if you are a premium subscriber and your payment came in this week, I want to thank you. So, uh, we had a one-time $100 payment from Steve from California. So thank you, Steve. We had $10 uh, monthly payments from Tony from Massachusetts, Ken from Kailua, 
David from Illinois, Clive from West Sussex, Jeff from Indiana, Joseph from Georgia, Scott from California, and Robert from Alabama. So thanks to all of you. And then on the $25 every six month plan, we had contributions from William from New York, Jeff from Maine, David from Kentucky, from Nando from Pennsylvania, Andrew from Honolulu, Royce also from Hawaii. Lee from Maine actually is on the $50 every six month plan because you can adjust your amount. So thank you. Uh, Lyndon from Kent, Michael from Oklahoma, Brian from Arizona and James from Texas. So thanks to all of you for uh, for being premium subscribers and supporting the show and all of that good stuff. I think I have one last thing, John, that we have time for today, just because we spent so much time talking. Apple created news that was sort of relevant for our show here. I know it's crazy. But um, listener Chris asked, he said, back in show 748, you mentioned that you would update us on how your experience with using the OB200 and Google Voice was going. Uh, he says, as a current Comcast Xfinity VoIP customer, I'm considering following your path into free VoIP service with this. How is it going? Any gotchas or tips? And I, my apologies. I, I totally remember saying this and I thought I had gone through it, but uh, but I haven't. It. It has been working splendiferously. Um, it really is blissful. In fact, I, I'm kind of kicking myself, as we always do, you know, for not having done this sooner. It is so much more pleasant uh, dealing with the Google Voice stuff than it was dealing with the Xfinity stuff. Money aside, like it's just a better experience for us because we can get the emails sent and the notifications sent the way we wanted. Xfinity's notifications were always kind of weird and wonky. But um, for those of you that that don't know what I'm talking about here, I had a VoIP line from our, our cable company, which for us is Xfinity, and they started charging me for it. It was free as part of our bundle for a while, and then that stopped. And so it went, I think it was, I think it went to 15 bucks a month for a short period of time and then was going to 25 and was like, okay, that we got to do away with that because either one of those numbers <laughs> is not okay. And, uh, and I knew that Google voice was free. The trick is that you cannot port directly from, uh, the only thing that you can port into Google voice is a mobile number. That's a better way to say it. So mm. I had to do an intermediary step. I ported my phone number from Xfinity to T-Mobile because I was able to get a $10 T-Mobile SIM. And then I ported this number from T-Mobile into Google voice and Google voice charged 20 bucks. So there was $30 worth of, uh, porting fees, essentially one to buy the T-Mobile SIM. I signed up for a $3 a month plan. So, uh, $33 and, and you know, it was fine. And that took all of about, I want to say five days, maybe total to, to do, you know, both of them together. Uh, they say it takes three days each, but it didn't quite. So I think it was four or five days. And then once I got it into Google voice, I used this thing that, uh, a fellow listener recommended, which is called the OB 200 OBI 200. And it's, um, it's this great little box. It's that plugs into your ethernet port on your, you know, you just plug it in ethernet into your router, into your network or whatever. And then you log into it with a web interface and sign into your Google voice account and it mat maps up and syncs up to your Google voice account. And then you plug, it's got an ethernet port on it and it's got an RJ 11 port. And I plugged it into our phone lines in the house and boom, everything's good to go. The phone rings when it rings, you can make calls going out just like having a landline without paying anyone, anything, then it's wonderful. So I think uh, it was, that was about, 50 bucks for that thing. Uh, there's, there's, we'll put an Amazon link in the show notes. There's, they come in white and black. I bought the white one cause it was 50 when I got it. I checked the other day that's 65, but the black one's 50. So get the black one. You know, it doesn't really matter what color it is. It's going to sit behind your router. The things, I don't know, half the size of an iPhone. It's tiny. So it doesn't, it's just big enough to plug a couple of ports and plug a couple of cables in. It works great. So I think uh, what I spent, uh, so 50, $83, right. All in. And nice. yeah, I think that'll take uh three and a half months and I'm almost, I'm almost there. So yeah, it's pretty good. You were talking about doing this too. Cause you said your, your phone company started charging you, right? Um, no, no, I have an intro deal. So I have a uh, VoIP through my uh, cable modem. Yeah. With, uh, optimum. Yeah. And it's yeah. uh 15 bucks a month. 
And oh, so they are charging you. Okay. So you could make this back. And I, yeah, you know, I always look at the, the deal. They're going to jack it up eventually. And then, you know, we got to do, do the, uh, the dance, you know, stupid dance every year. Yeah. Well, we'll just do this dance and then you're done. Right. Cause, uh, right. If yeah, you do it for 83 the, bucks, the, you, less yeah, than six trust, months, less than trust, six months. Trust. What, what, well, so I, I'm with you, actually. That That's a fair concern. <laughs> no, it's not. But what do you Just use like your- Amazon, they're monitoring your traffic. You know this. Of course. I mean, well, don't you find it weird? You know, I've seen so many people say this that I, I, I like to believe that they don't do this, but it's just too weird. So you're talking about something in front of your S person or A person, and all of a sudden you see an ad for something related to that. Like when you're surfing the web, it's like, that's just too weird. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just me. No, no, no. It's weird. Um, I find that Google like to think they're not listening to me, but are they listening to me and showing me ads uh, for things that I may want to buy? I mean, that, that, that's okay, but just let me know you're doing it. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Just let us know. That's (laughs) right. Yeah. I find their spam filtering it for phone calls and, you know, text messages and all that on Google voice is fantastic. I'm glad you mentioned that. So the thing is, um, there've been articles as of late, the Verizon is going to offer free spam. Phone we talked calls about there. it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden I noticed like, since we last talked, I'm now seeing, and I'm not running their app, but I'm seeing things in my incoming call registry that either says, potential spam or unknown caller or the name of somebody because they're the, the, somebody spamming is still using the let's use the first six digits of your phone number to make you think it's somebody you know now it's coming up with names of people that i don't know that are uh, in the same yeah. town that my number is in which is narwhal but it's like i don't know who this guy is <laughs> sure so, so i think they change rather than requiring you to get their app they just baked it into their Whatever their their cell software, yeah, right, their incoming call software, right. Because all of a sudden, I'm like, well, why are you saying that? You've never said that to me before. That's great. Huh. That's good. That's how it should be. <laughs> yeah, I, you, you're right. They, Everybody you know, offers it. I think Verizon was kind of lagging as far as their free offering, which I think all of them should do because it's it's. So I want to circle back to this Google Voice thing with you though, because you bring up please. a good point. No. How much do you use your landline? Like, how much does this matter? <sighs> And, you know, could, I mean, if it's VoIP, I mean, it's probably all encrypted. And so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, again, putting on my tinfoil hat. No, I, you who, know me. I love the listening? tinfoil hats. And yeah. Who watches the watchers, you know? Yeah. It's like, are they monitoring my traffic on behalf of the government? And if they hear certain keywords, uh, is it even possible? I mean, even, um, you know, at the event today, Tim said one thing that's a very important app. He's like, hey, it's between you and whoever. Yeah. None of our business. Right. Right. But I I guess like for us, we don't, our landline is used so infrequently that really we could have gone, we could have just done away with it and probably been fine. But there's a few places that still have our landline. It's like, ah, you know what? Like, and, and (sighs) honestly, you know, we've got a daughter away at college and stuff. Our phones go on, do not disturb at night. We've actually had an issue where, she was trying to call us in the middle of the night and it couldn't get through, but oh. she called, but she was able to call on the house line. And it's like, okay, so it's worth, you know, a hundred bucks to just lock this number in and it's ours forever. And we don't have to worry about it. Okay. It, you know, my only reflection on getting VoIP versus <sighs> copper, which I used to have until several years, oh, a yeah. few years ago. Copper's a done deal. Is yeah. that, is that the, Voice quality is, I find it more consistent under VoIP than cell phone. Cell phone being RF and the other being over cable. It, I've had uh, not not that it not depends. as many as of late, but yeah. um, I mean, I got I I can see a, a cell antenna like from my house, so I know I get a good signal, or I should be getting a good signal. Well, but, but if you're doing like LTE there. HD voice, then you'll get you'll get a better signal on you know, on, on that, than you will over like Google voice or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. Right. And actually when I've talked to somebody who I know has that service, it's like, you know, like the heavens heavens open. It was like, 
oh my gosh, you sound awesome for being an RF signal. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, th- it's like this. We use discord here, right? I mean, it's the, you know, same kind of thing. Right. We just get great quality voice. So but most yeah. of the, uh, uh, most of the people I know are not on Verizon, but when somebody's on Verizon HD audio, it's like, oh, yeah, you can tell. Right. It's just like, it's right. so weird. It's like, that's wow, good. Is- yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Another good one, folks. Thank you so much for, uh, for hanging out with us. Thank you for sending in all your stuff. Thanks for everybody in the chat room, kind of following along and helping out. Thanks. Thanks really thank for you everything. Thank you for learning with us because yeah, that's really it. You learn. We learn. We all learn. And that's, that's a, is that a good thing? I think it's a good, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into it. I'm into it. Uh, visit us in the forums, macgeekup.com slash forums. And, uh, and, and a favor, and I'll ask this at the beginning of, of next episode, but uh, we really would appreciate some iTunes reviews. I, I know many of you have done them already, and, and that's, that's great. I don't think you can do another one, which would be nice. But if you haven't done one, please go to MacGeekab.com slash iTunes. That's the closest I can get you. Then from there, you've got to sort of click and say, I want to review the show, and, and then it'll let you. But uh, it really does help us, uh, you know, every now and then to have kind of a, a few extra I, iTunes reviews come in. So and it helps you because it gets us up on the. Uh, yeah. More listeners is good for everybody. More listener yeah. grows the community. And the thing is, more people that have their fingers in this pie, the better for all of us. The better for all. Absolutely. Unless you haven't washed your hands, in which case, dude. Come on. Yeah. Well, it's actually fine because we don't have to touch each other here in the Mackie Gap community. So that's not a bad thing. Uh, so yeah, please do that. We'd, we'd love that. Uh, so thanks to all of you. Thanks to everybody that is doing those iTunes reviews. You rock. You have a special place that where you rock. That's nice. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks to Cashfly, of course, for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to our sponsors, of course, OWC at MaxSales.com. Jamf now at Jamf.com slash MGG. Hair Club at hairclub.com slash MGG. Barebones at barebones.com. Eero at eero.com slash MGG. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. So much good stuff. John, anything, anything lasting to add? I don't know. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but for three weeks now, Dave, I've been telling you, and you've been succeeding. It's working. In the effort that we all should make throughout our lives is that don't get caught. Made up.